you hear me okay? Oh, now we can. <laughs> it's time, time to begin. Our, our numbers are down a little bit today because Metro is having their family camp out at Camp Yamhill, but uh, we're happy to have those of you who are with us this morning. We're continuing our, our study in the book of 2 Corinthians, and I titled this, story, this uh, study, Paul Opens His Heart to the Corinthians, because this book is full of Paul's feelings about things, his emotions and uh, his concerns. Uh, we, we learn a lot about the personality of Paul from this letter because he did open his heart to the Corinthians. Today we're going to be in chapter 7. And chapter 7 doesn't have a lot of doctrine. It, it's, uh, I think the main theme of chapter 7 is about relationships between Christians. And uh, I always try to pick a background that <coughs> is, goes along with what I think the major theme is. And today I picked this sculpture. It's taken from a cathedral in Spain. Of, of two men embracing. And I, I thought that kind of symbolizes what this uh, chapter is about. It's, it's about, um, well, as you know, there was a lot of conflict in the Corinthian church, a lot of troubles, but throughout all that conflict and troubles, there, there's a lot of love also. And, and Paul never loses his love for the Corinthian church, and, and they never lose their love for him. <clears throat> so let's start in uh, chapter 7, verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. Um, when I read this, I got to thinking about it, and I don't think anyone was accusing Paul of these things because he took great care not to be a burden to the church. He, he earned his own living. He didn't ask them for money. Um, he, he did everything he could to, to, to not be a burden to them. What I think he's um, talking about here is that he's comparing himself to this group of men that he refers to as the super apostles. Uh, there's a group of, of people who are trying to put Paul down, making disparaging comments about him. And, uh, and they're, they're causing trouble in the church. And I think they're trying to turn the, the uh, people at Corinth against Paul. And uh, so I'm going to skip ahead to chapter 11 and read a couple of things that I think might shed some light on why he says that he hasn't wronged anyone, he hasn't corrupted anyone, and he hasn't exploited anyone. In chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, verses 4 through 5, <clears throat> we read, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. So apparently these people are teaching a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel, and, and yet they're putting up with him, uh, with them. And in uh, the same chapter, verse 20, it says, In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or pushes himself forward or slaps you in the, in the face. I didn't get all that in there. But so apparently these, these men are abusive and they're taking advantage of the church. And yet the church is putting up with that, and uh, he's, he's telling them to uh, open their hearts to him also because he isn't doing any of those things. 
verse 3. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. What, what does that phrase indicate when he says that he would live or he would live or die with them? Does that remind you of any other story in the Bible? Yeah, Ruth, Ruth and Naomi. Um, when you say that you will live or die with someone, you're, you're expressing your love for, for that person. And in the story of Ruth, uh, Naomi's um, husband and two sons both die. And uh, Naomi's telling her daughter-in-laws to, to stay, go back to their families because she's going to go back to Israel. And uh, Ruth didn't want to leave. She said, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your, your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. So, so when you say you're going to live and die with someone or are willing to live and die with someone, you're, you're expressing your great love for, for those people. Uh, verse 4 of chapter 7. I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. He, he's going to explain a little bit more why he has joy. He's, he's heard good news about them and about their faithfulness. Uh, what, was, what was Paul's... Um, main goal in life? Ben? His main goal in life was to have a focus on the Lord and, and in this case to preach the word. He didn't want to be preached to. He, he, he was pretty certain that he would get a complete life and be a good husband and be successful in life. That's right. His, his whole life was focused on bringing the good news to people and not just bringing the good news to them, but, but making sure that they grew and matured. And uh, that's what gives him great joy. And that, that was one of the characteristics of all the apostles. Uh, look at 3 John. This is the Apostle John writing. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So, so here again, Paul is expressing his love for the people of Corinth. It, it gives him great joy to hear that they're walking in the truth and that, that they're faithful. Okay, let's move to a different section, verses 5 through 7. For when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within, but God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Um, you know, I forgot to ask for a volunteer to carry this microphone around. Is there anyone who would be willing to do that? Someone who's fleet of foot? <laughs> Jim, thank you. <laughs> um, this, this section starts with Paul referring to the sufferings. He's, he's enduring conflicts and fears 
And he's given us an other list in this book of the things that he's endured. Why, why did Paul have to suffer so much? Here he is, a faithful apostle, devo devoting his life to bringing the good news to people. Why, why does God let him suffer so much? Yes, Lou? And he, he was spreading the gospel and people didn't like it. So he went through hardships. And since, you know, I knew what that I knew what that felt like when um I for four for four years I was with we care we got a lot of flack because we were preaching the gospel and preaching um the good news I mean um it's part it's part of the life. Okay, that's just part of the, the, what it means to be a minister, yes. Through his sufferings and what we've seen, he stayed strong in the Lord. He never denounced him, and it gives me courage to keep walking even through discomfort or whatever because he's with me. That's right. Paul is an example to us when we see how he suffered and, and was willing to put up with it. It's an encouragement to us. Yes, Jill. I think it's through suffering and <coughs> overcoming difficulties that makes you strong. Okay. And I think often that's why we have difficulties and struggles. It's because we need to grow. Okay. Yeah. Um, suffering in the Christian life has a purpose. It helps us develop. It helps us become stronger. Bob? In Hebrews chapter 12, it tells why um, God expects us to go, go, go through suffering, and though we don't like the pain. But if we get through it, we, we can be thankful for, uh, for God. Uh, God's grace, his power, his love, wisdom means much more to us than. And only that, too, look how much more we can comfort somebody else who is suffering. If we haven't suffered then that's not a good sign e e either. So uh, uh, that that's something that uh, we all, all need to, to, to be aware of. Mm -hmm. That's right. Ben? In all of this, I'm reminded about Job. Job had it all. Mm -hmm. And the devil is out there trying to do his best. God puts limits on, as we see through Job, God puts limits on what the devil does, but Job, in spite of everything that he went through, <clears throat> he never did what his friends asked him to, his wife asked him, curse God and die. You've gotten to have done something wrong. The idea behind this is Paul, at the beginning of this, said, I've done no wrong. I have not done anything that would should be because of my Christian attitude, a conflict for people. They make it that way because the devil tries to bring out the selfish side of ourselves, the sinful side. Mm -hmm. And that's the struggle that we have. And it's always going to be a conflict, whether it's a conflict from the outside or the fears from within. And Paul addresses that here. It's about struggling towards Christ because we know there's an enemy out there trying to bring us down. Okay. Um, a physical analogy. Uh, I don't know how many here have been to uh, Clay Lock on the Washington Peninsula, Olympic Peninsula. There's a tree there that's uh, world renowned because it's it's situated quite literally over a little creek that dumps into the ocean. And on one side, it has its branches um, and its roots that you can see some exposed. And on the other side of this creek, there's more branches and, mm -hmm. and deep roots. That thing has held on. We've um, gone to Claylock since the 80s. And since then, a picture of that tree has made it around the world as an example of how uh, important it is to have deep roots uh, in the tree world. 
trees need along the coast to have deep roots mm -hmm. because if you've ever seen a coastline, a lot of the branches on the windward side, the ocean side, are gone. Mm -hmm. And only the branches on the land side remain. But those trees are strong and don't blow over because of the root system. And I think in our life as Christians, um, if we don't have pain that causes growth, we will be blown over when the storms of life rage. Yeah. Glenn? The greatest example of a suffering servant is our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. He came to earth the Son of God, and he suffered through his entire life. That way, I don't know about his childhood, but uh, as in his adult life, he suffered. He was a man of sorrows. And yet, parallel with that is a joy uh, that, uh, that Paul is expressing here. You can be suffering, and you can suffer like Jesus did, with no promise that that we're not going to have suffering. There's nothing in the Christian doctrine that says we're not going to suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, some have tried to do that. Some have tried to make out a, you know, that uh, Christians don't suffer. If if you really follow Christ, you're not going to suffer. Well, that's absolutely wrong because Christ was a man of sorrows. Mm -hmm. But along parallel with that is the joy of 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 uh, Paul as he's expressing the joys that he had mm -hmm. and and I'm sure that Jesus would express the same kind of joys the joy of of Christian fellowship and the joy of knowledge that we are a part of God that God dwells within us now there's nothing that could be more joyful than that even though our body may may suffer some uh, kinds of of pain and our minds may also suffer kinds of pain the, the man that we follow is a called the man, this the man of sorrows. That's right. And and speaking of him, he promised us that we would suffer. In John sixteen thirty three, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus promised us that we'd have, have trouble in this world and he he endured the same kind of trouble or probably worse than what we're going to endure so yes everything that he went through he knew before he came that this was going to happen mm -hmm. and that even makes it more heartfelt that he left heaven and he knew what we would do to him down here. Yeah, and and it, in the garden we we see that he wasn't really looking forward to that suffering. Yes, um, we we watched the movie Friday night, uh, the Hiding Place, and if if you haven't seen that for a while, watch it again. It's this this is one of the main themes of that movie is that this family. Uh, were hiding Jews during the Nazi occupation of, of Holland and uh, they eventually got caught and sent to a, uh, a concentration camp and uh, they, they endured great suffering and, uh, but they kept their faith and they studied the Bible regularly in, in their barracks and at one point they were having a Bible study and an atheist, one of the other inmates there was saying um, saying that your God, why does your God allow all this suffering if he's a loving God? So, so that's one of the, the uh, main objections that we're going to hear in this world is that how could a good God allow suffering? But the Bible teaches that God does allow suffering and, and that it has a purpose and, and that we we have to endure some suffering in our life. Well, uh, Paul mentions in this passage we just read Titus, how, how the coming of Titus brought him great joy. Uh, so let's look a little bit about Titus's relationship uh, with, or, or Paul's relationship with Titus. 
Number one, even though Paul had a promising ministry going in Troas, he said he didn't have peace of mind because Titus didn't come. And so he left Troas and went to Macedonia to find, to find him. So that, that shows the, the great love that he had for Titus and, and the importance that that relationship had for him. That, that's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2.12. To this, this passage we just read, it, it brought Paul great comfort and joy when Titus did come. Number three, Paul addresses one of his New Testament letters to Titus, one of the pastoral epistles. Um, Titus accompanied Paul on one of Paul's trips to Jerusalem, it, which is mentioned in Galatians 2. And everything that Paul has to say about Titus is positive. In all that you read about Titus, you never hear anything negative about him. He was a, a faithful minister of the gospel. Okay, we're going to get to an interesting section here in verses 8 through 10 of chapter 7. <clears throat> Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter... I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Okay, Paul, uh, some of the scholars that write about Paul say that there was a third letter that we don't have that came between uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. They, they call it the severe letter, where he really... Um, rebuked them and got after them for the sins and I'm not I'm not sure if there was a third letter but I think I think um first Corinthians has enough rebuke and stuff in it to qualify for for what he's saying here um we d we don't like to correct people and rebuke people do we what What's your feeling about that? As an elder, sometimes we're called to do that, but it's not something that I enjoy. Um, why, why do we not like rebuking or correcting? Yes, Lee? Hmm. <laughs> The question was, why don't we like the rebuke? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't seem loving. Okay. But when you do it in love, that person can change. And that's the important part of, of our situation. I've been, I've been rebuked most of my life. <laughs> And if I didn't take it, I wouldn't be what I am today. So, if you're rebuked, listen to the person who's rebuking you. Yeah, sometimes it's necessary. And, and the Bible says that sometimes elders need to be rebuked. So, I need to be ready to, to hear correction when I do wrong. Jim? It's a, a phrase we hear all of the time, but we don't. I don't think about it enough. Care enough to confront? If I f surround myself with people that just tell me things that tickle my ears and make me feel good about myself and support me in whatever activity I'm involved with, uh, that's one way to live life. 
I would like to surround my people, myself with people that actually care enough that they see me going the wrong way and they say, hey, Jim, uh, you might want to consider what you said or your attitude. I don't think it was appreciated and mm -hmm. you may not have intended it, but this is what I perceived and maybe that person did too. The point is, I want people to love me enough to risk our relationship. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, I think that's what marriage is all about. If you've chosen, like I have chosen, a wife that's not afraid to tell me when I'm out of line or I've said something that somebody may not have appreciated or may have taken wrong, I love that about Marcia because mm -hmm. it, at the time it hurts. I'm not going to say it doesn't because your ego gets involved. Mine does anyhow. And, uh, but on the long game, the point is, as we have pulled each other, I guess our, one of our jobs is to get each other to heaven, to help one another to heaven. And that's part of the reason that you rebuke. That's right. Being rebuked has good effects if you take it the right way. Um, yes. Ben? Oh. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, I, my fear if you say something to someone that comes across as I'm, I'm uh, trying to help you through this or something, the first word you hear is don't be judgmental. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fear that all of us have now. We are going to be uh, accused of being judgmental. Mm -hmm. And yes, we are in a way, but how we handle it is what, is what makes the difference. It's how, how you approach someone to rebuke them. It has to be done in love, and, and Paul does it in love, doesn't he? He's, he said that, that he didn't regret rebuking them or correcting them, but he said, but I did regret it at the time because I see that it hurts you. So, so he's, he's not being insensitive. He's, he's doing it for their welfare, but, it, but it's still a hard thing even for Paul to do. Yes. I say it shows the level of love. We, we say we love people, but Paul was showing how much he cared. It concerned him. It hurt him to see them doing the things of sin because he cared so much about them and knew how bad it was for them. It's kind of like a parent and child relationship or those kind of marriage relationships. And, and we talk about living and dying together. That is a marriage commitment that people make it's mm -hmm. the level of love how concerned are we about other people paul shows he's extremely concerned about people and it hurts him to see people that he knows are lost but he just can't save them the corinthians is the same way he wanted them to come and they did come to a repentance that said we need to right ourselves the letter hurt but the greatest hurt would have been losing them to things that would tear them away from God. Mm -hmm. We see this throughout the New Testament on how people became lukewarm or because they had lost their first love. Mm -hmm. Revelation speaks to that. It's that level of concern, that level of love that's causes us to want to correct people. Yeah, let me uh, read a couple of examples of his rebuking in uh, 1 Corinthians. Let me get my glasses on here. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 4, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? So, so he's getting pretty direct here. They're immature. They're, there's jealousy and quarreling. Um, Chapter 5, 
verses 1 through 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may not be destroyed, so the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. That's some pretty direct language criticism. Chapter 6. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. So, so once again, he's very direct that what they're doing is wrong. Chapter 11, uh, verses 17 through 22. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. So Paul said some hard things to the people at Corinth. And, uh, and what, was the, what was the outcome of, of that, of that uh, rebuke, of, of those rebukes? It brought them sorrow. And uh, in this last verse we read, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. So in other words, they were sorrowful in a good way and it made them repent and, and do better. But worldly sorrow brings death. I want to talk a little bit about what the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow is. What, what's the difference between those two types of sorrow? Ben? The difference is the way that it goes about it. Godly sorrow says, I'm guilty, I need to change. I need to not just affect change in my life, but affect change in my relationship with the people that I've offended and make sure that my relationship still stays the same with those who may not have been offended. Okay. Worldly sorrow says, wow, I didn't get away with it. How, how can I be judged this way? We see the world this way. They say, well, how can you judge me with this way? Well, your actions go farther than you realize. They always have. They look in the courts at the person sitting there and maybe the few victims, but it goes much further to, to the community, to how the world views us. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow doesn't make the same effect of how the world views us because we're consistent and we realize our relationship with each other and with the world needs to be directed towards God in the fact that we care about everyone. Okay. Worldly sorrow just cares about themselves. Okay, that's a good point. Worldly sorrow is self-centered. Godly sorrow is centered on what God's will is. Bob? Uh, Bob? 
and definitely realize how this caught up with my life too and helped me to see the need of change here. When you're looking at this idea of repentance, it's not just uh, saying I'm sorry, it also has to do with the person's attitude in his life. He's showing that he's gonna uh, do something that is contrary to his life of sin. Just like the prophet Ezekiel had taught the people that you know, they need, need to back up the repentance with deeds and caring for one another. And I like what James says over here when he says to even Christian people, he says, uh, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he's going to flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And I see that James speaks right through what Paul is saying right over here. Yeah. Uh, hum that, humbling that yourself. That's an application of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus had taught the disciples. Let me, uh, let me look at an example of, of worldly sorrow. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the, the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Was, was Judas sorry? Did he have sorrow? What, what was wrong with his sorrow? What was that? Let me, uh, is not really true of repentance. Yeah, yeah it wasn't a... Line, that is the, the, the word that stands for repentance and other related meanings right over there. Do you, th do you think Jesus would have forgiven Judas if he had truly repented? Yeah. So he wasn't repenting in the right way. He was sorry for what he'd done. And I think he was feeling more sorry for himself than, than thinking about his relationship with God. Yeah, it was a, a worldly sorrow. And another example, I think, is found in Matthew 19. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And, and I'm going to skip parts of, of this passage and just put the ones that, that I think are relevant. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Was this a, a godly sorrow? This, this was a worldly sorrow. What, what was his concern? Yeah, the, th the thing that he loved the most was money, and he was unwilling to give that up. Now, we don't know if later he might may have changed his mind. You know, everybody makes the wrong choices at a certain time. June? Denied Jesus uh, the three times or whatever, you know, before the crow, and Jesus looked at him. He wept, so he was sorry in a godly manner. I think. Yeah. Seemed to be. Yeah, Peter was sorry for what he did, but he truly repented of, of it, and that led him to be a better better person. Ben? <laughs> We're missing one more example with Judas. 
the chief, the high priest and the elders said, well, what is that to us? They didn't care. They were only concerned about their person, their how they were perceived. And it should have hurt them more. So we've got two examples in there. Of okay. Judas, and I think Judas was very sorry that he had betrayed innocent blood. But when he went to the Jewish leadership, they didn't care. So he lost everything. He didn't have his Jewish backing, which he thought he was doing the right thing. And he felt like he didn't have Jesus backing him either because he was considered the one who was betraying. Okay. Well, uh, yes. Some sort of sign how of something why um, his remorse, his sorrow, that he hung himself. Yeah, he he definitely had sorrow, but it it wasn't directed in the right way. It wasn't it wasn't directed toward God. It was directed toward himself and his own feelings, Jim. I think any of us that have had any experience with addiction know that you have a lot of sorrow and you have different ways of expressing that sorrow and they're usually destructive. I, in fact, I would say most of the time uh, your reaction, your sorrow is destructive and that's not what God wants. He wants us to have godly sorrow which leads to repentance. Yeah, we can be sorry for the things we've done and the pain we've caused people, but that doesn't do anybody any good most of all yourself okay well we just have one minute left so i'm going to read what the what the results of godly sorrow were in the corinthian church see what this godly sorrow has produced in you what earnestness what eagerness to clear yourselves what indignation what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So godly sorrow produces your longing to do better. You're, uh, you're wanting to see what is right done. And uh, so, so we need to examine ourselves when we do have sorrow is it the right kind of sorrow and and is it producing the fruits in our lives that it should produce so that brings us to the end of time so at the end of this time anyway uh, thank you mm.